Hello, my friends. Welcome back to the Faith Unraveled podcast, where we discuss the chapter of life after a big awakening. I'm Alicia, your host, and I am so super excited to introduce you to our first guests on the podcast. You may recognize Sally and Lena from the very popular Hulu series entitled Mormon No More. Lena and Sal have become instrumental figures in the deconstruction community, helping people to come out of the closet and come out of their religion. And today we've got some very important topics to discuss. We'll not only dive into Sally and Lena's story, but we're going to get some tips from them for LGBTQ young adults who have not yet come out. And we're going to get some tips for their parents as well. This is a very meaningful episode today, and I'm honored to welcome Sally and Lena to the show. I'm so happy to be here. Thanks for having us, Alicia. I feel so super honored. Thank we you. love you. We are honored to be your first guests, and uh, we are real life friends, so this feels like a fun hangout. <laughs> Doesn't it? Oh. Yeah. <laughs> I'm stoked to be here uh, and discuss all of these juicy topics, and also glad that we have a platform to to support and talk and, you know, heal together. Yeah. Before we get started, I would love to highlight your platforms. So could you each tell us a little about what you're doing through social media and your own podcast and what kind of resources you provide? Yeah. So Sally and I together have Peace Out. It's our company and we host in-person retreats and have courses. And we also uh, have our podcast, Peace Out. It's how we sort of were found and to do the documentary, they really wanted to highlight four guests from our podcast. So on each episode of Mormon No More, you will see <laughs> one person that has been a guest on our podcast, one of which was Maddie Easton, who we're going to talk about today and the musket talk. So we're big fans of Maddie. We love him so, 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 so much. Uh, but Sally and I together have Instagram platforms as well. I'm Lena underscore Osborne, and she is coming out coach. I uh, do energy work and coaching and all the spirituality fun stuff with me over Zoom or in person. And she works now with Natasha Hilfer at Symmetry. So you can make an appointment there or you can message her on Instagram and she will help you if you're coming out of the closet or if you're coming out of the church. So, yep, we've been doing this work for a while and it feels very aligned with us. We yeah. feel called to it and we're just really grateful for opportunities to uh, show representation of what life could be like and mm -hmm. how life is not over when you leave the church. It is beautiful and we're really, I just feel like I'm representing everyone when I'm like in public, in the yeah. public um, eye. It's not always easy to be in the public eye. I still get comments every day of uh, you know, you're selfish and you're deceived and all that stuff. And mm -hmm. it, it doesn't really get to me anymore. And so I feel like I'm in a good place. Yeah. <laughs> and just thankful to be able to connect with other people going through the same thing. And it just feels like it's building, you know, it's just continuing to build. We're well aware that it's far bigger than us. Yeah. And if you are in that tr transition stage, or if you've been in the middle of it, or even if it seems like it's in your past, our course Mormon No More, we're running a 50% off right now, and you can use the code Faith Unravel to get you 50% off as a kickoff for our season three podcast. Hey, thank you so much for this offering. To me, it's almost a magical experience seeing people like you that I know in real life who have this tremendous talent and gift for just holding space for people. And so seeing this whole life experience that you have, which now informs the capacity that you're working in with clients and putting content out there, it's just really, really beautiful. Thank you. Thanks, Alicia. We love you. So would you mind giving a life sketch? I think even for those who have seen the documentary, it's fun to hear people's life sketch from their perspective. So can we start with Sal and then go to Lena next? Or would you like to go the other way around? I'm trying like to think to go of first. some some little special thing that I haven't ever said before. I know, right? I'm like, how can uh -huh. I entertain this audience? <laughs> <laughs> a look behind the curtain. <clears throat> I grew up uh, in, a, in a traditional Mormon family. My dad was an FBI agent. Uh, I have four brothers. My mom is my bestie. She, she was my bestie growing up because I was the only girl. And... I was a tomboy and uh, thought that 
that I would grow out of it, as they say. They thought I was just like copying my brothers and just trying to be like them. Turns out it never went away. But I tried to mask it for a long time. Uh, I was a Mormon all-star and, you know, scrupulous about being a good Mormon girl. Did all the things. Ended up at BYU. Met my husband. Uh, we got married. I got married my sophomore year at BYU and was barely 20 years old. We were in a band. This is fun. I'll say this. I mm -hmm. probably have said this before. But some people don't know. We were in a band called Love You Long Time. We opened for MC Hammer and Vanilla Ice. Stop it right now. We uh, we played the Warp Tour side stage. We toured all over the country. We uh, Neon Trees opened for them. Yeah, we used to play shows with Neon Trees all the time, and they were they were the opening band. And I remember stop it right. Yeah, now. they're awesome. And I remember sitting in a their tour van outside of In and Out. Uh, like at one in the morning and they played us their first demo of whoa I want some more whoa -oh. and we were just like yeah this is awesome and then they opened for us in Logan uh, Utah at this little show and these uh, record label had flown out from New York to watch them and they got signed that night you can put do YouTube like love you long time dream killer that's one of our songs or yeah. party like I used to and then we're on Spotify too but it's fun to see the footage of it. There's lots of random videos that you can find. And uh, it was a blast. I played the guitar. It was like a... And she sang. Yeah. I was like the token girl in the band that was entertaining everyone. I did vocal, like backup vocal. And then um, and then Shane and I, my ex-husband, we were on the TV show called Wipeout. And Stop. with like the bills, you know, like the obstacle course totally. show. Totally. We were just kids with, you know, in, in the L.A. area and we're like, they oh. They won the show. Yeah. We we, we, we won $50,000. Yes. And so my my ex has, he's 6'4 and he has super long legs. So he just like, just like trotted across all the obstacles. And uh, so we ended up quitting the band and starting a business and, and staying in Southern California. And that's how we ended up here. Because we came here just for the summer and never went back. And uh and then I did the Mormon thing. I was like the Yono Oko of the Beatles. I broke up the band because I was like, I need to be a Mormon mom. We can't be be reckless forever. So we need to settle down. So we settled down with the the business and I had three babies. And then Shane, he ran into the information about Joseph Smith. And this was in 20, probably 15. And then for two years, he was like faith crisising. And I was like, no. I will not. And it was really tough. He was sharing it with me. So I was being prepped kind of more like against my will. <laughs> and subconsciously, I was becoming more comfortable with knowing this information. And I was, you know, witnessing him not become a bad person. I was witnessing him, you know, uh, become awakened. And that was confusing to me. And so we ended up going to see a, a, ther a PMO therapist. Like, still going to church, but she didn't believe. So it was a perfect thing where I could feel safe and he could feel safe. And uh, she helped me to get to a place where I would be open to hearing the information. And so it only took me like a week before I was like, oh, this is all shit. <laughs> and no way. And someone who is, for those who don't know, the word PIMO, it's like a part of the ex-Mormon vernacular, physically and mentally out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It was a decision made out of, like, love for my family unit and my marriage. And I was like, it was kind of going to fall apart if I didn't do something drastic. And so so I did. And I'm really glad that I did. And thank you, Shane, because uh, that's why I'm here now. And and uh, we kind of started deconstructing and we, we found a ex-Mormon community here in Southern California. And I was kind of in my angry, you know, fuck you phase. And I shaved my head. And uh, and then I met Lena. <laughs> so that was about like a year wow. after I, I had left the church and she had just moved from Washington, D.C. and made friends with some of my I only kept a few friends in the church and they were like kind of on their way out. Um, and they made friends with Lena really quickly after Lena moved in the ward. And they were like, you guys need to meet each other. You're going to be good friends. And I was like, 
no, thank you. I don't need any more Mormon mom friends. Like, I'm not interested. Uh, and at that time, had you started deconstructing the sex- stuff around sexuality yet? I was dipping my toes uh, into that. It's kind of unavoidable when you leave the church. Uh, people talk a lot about sexuality. And so I was kind of like witnessing other people explore their sexuality at that point. So I was mm-hmm. I feel like I was getting prepped for for Lena. And I was very much into mindfulness at the time and very much in the space where I realized that I had lied to myself and repressed myself just as a person for the whole time I was in the church. So I was in a place where I was like, anything that comes up, I'm committed to not pushing down. Mm-hmm. I, I don't want to do that That's anymore. Awesome. That is not what my life will be. So I was kind of just like made a promise to myself that I would honor the deconstruction process and whatever was underneath there as I started peeling. And it was um, scary. It was very scary. And I knew that there could be repercussions to that. And so that's kind of why I didn't move faster with that, because I was like, pump the brakes. Something in my intuition under there knew that like there had been problems with our sexual relationship for so long and I knew that like it wasn't going to be simple and and that there would be discoveries being made you know it made me very nervous and to Shane he was like what's the big deal like why are you so nervous why are you so weird about all this I'm just like because he had I had always been kind of nervous about sexuality but I think um he I got got in as like a prude and you were slut shamed. I was prude shamed. I right. I was like the opposite. I, like you're so good. I've heard a lot. You know. I've heard a lot of LGBT people talk about this. Yeah, I was I was like kind of made fun of for for not being more sexual, for for not liking and being uncomfortable with sexuality. And I got teased a lot and uh, by my brothers and and even Shane was just like confused and and frustrated. You know that I wasn't more sexual and and that's so valid (laughs) i mean now it makes a lot of sense but it really felt shitty you know so so after the deconstruction do you feel like there was stuff coming up that made sense now looking back in retrospect it makes perfect sense everything i mean i had made up this idea of myself in high school that i was like boy crazy I realize now it was just a cover up like, yeah, I love boys. These guys are so cute. Like, oh, yeah, I'm so fun and flirty. And it was just a cover up like I didn't. I got this boyfriend in high school that was uh, my one of my brother's best friends. And I stayed with him for two years. And he was just a homie like we would skateboard together and snowboard together. There was some kissing, but like nothing more than that. And people were like, you were with him for two years and there no problems there. I'm like, no, it's great. I see that so clearly now as as just a way to avoid um, avoid the complications. It was like, oh, okay, I'm going to put that away for a while. And then when uh, he left on his mission, I had like mental break. Like I was so distraught and nervous. And then I got developed an eating disorder my senior year and uh, like health complications due to that. I was so unhealthy that that transition time from leaving high school to go to college because subconsciously I knew like shit I have to like get married I have to like now it's not dating for fun it's dating for marriage and I'm like this little closeted masculine lesbian (laughs) that's going to BYU and it was just so yeah so tough and uh wow I it it all makes sense now and mostly when I think about it I, I grieve I have compassion I have like, I just want to, like, hug that little girl and be like, you're just right. And women are going to women are going to be stoked, like, when you're yourself and you, you're going to be celebrated and, and being who you are is who, you know, who you're meant to be. And oh, yeah, it's hard. It's hard to think about sometimes. I bet it is. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that, Sally. Mm-hmm. Lena. I didn't grow up in the church, but I certainly grew up with spirituality. I am a child of like immigrant parents, first generation Italian. Uh, I just love the idea of connecting with ancestors and spent so much time at the cemetery growing up. So spirituality has just been a big part of my life. Also, my family was really Catholic. 
Uh, I definitely grew up like staunch and, you know, the idea of being gay was like, uh, nope, definitely not an option for this girl uh, or anyone else around me, really. And I, there were no examples of queer people in my life other than my mom's hairdresser and Ellen on TV. And I knew that there were like, you know, masculine looking police officers or PE teachers, but I certainly didn't see myself in them as a femme presenting uh, queer person. So it wasn't until like Ellen got together with Portia de Rossi that I was like, oh, that's interesting. Right. Like, huh. And for a while, I was conditioned to believe that she was faking it. You know, people would say to me like, uh, she just wants to be famous or she just wants Ellen's money. Like there was no part of me in the beginning that really understood the dynamic of that relationship. And I don't know. I think, you know, growing up outside the church, I, there are privileges. I do feel like I had more of a connection to my inner knowing. And, you know, the, the Catholic Church doesn't talk about the Holy Ghost the same way that the Mormon Church does. And so I knew it was mine when the missionaries confronted me after my best friend died in a car accident in high school. And I was just kind of being inundated with spirituality from all these places. Um, and the Mormons got to me for sure. I went to a few different congregations um, to find like peace and solidarity and like, you know, just connection to, to God and like why this happened. And I think too, being naive at 16, 17, I, was, I certainly thought somebody knows. Like, I can't be the only person on this planet that doesn't know what happens when we die like somebody certainly has the answer and so when the and that's the pitch that's yes. exactly the pitch and you're in such a vulnerable state when you've just experienced a tremendous loss absolutely and i i know it doesn't feel good to hear this but i was definitely groomed um and there was just a lot of like gaslighting in the beginning um now that i'm out i can see that but at the time it just felt so comforting that everyone was sure a hundred percent sure that they knew where she was and they knew the plan of salvation and the purpose of life and what, you know, my purpose was here and how I could live a life to be able to get to a place one day to see her again. And so, yeah, I worked really hard to do that. I went to BYU. I have something to add that you might not have said before. Oh, you had a Mormon boyfriend in high school. I did have a Mormon and boyfriend. And I find that ring because yeah. she's a lesbian mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. well, she was in Vegas. There's a lot of Mormons in Vegas. Mm -hmm. And uh, the fact that you had a Mormon boyfriend, you've told me, is because you knew they wouldn't try to get you to have sex. That's true. I mean, we definitely, like, messed around. Um, but I went to BYU with the hopes that, like, uh, like unconsciously. You would this marry This is not him? conscious. Okay. No, 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 no. I didn't think that. I thought going to BYU, I would be safe because sexuality did terrify me. Like, the idea of going to San Diego State and being a cheerleader and being a soror in a sorority, which is was definitely like the road toward where I was headed, um, would put me in a position to be vulnerable to sexuality. And I was hiding from it. I For a long time, I thought I was like asexual, especially in my marriage and stuff. Like I just, I don't know, there was just something really um, uncomfortable around it. I mean, I know now, but at the time, I didn't know. And... I could she, quite she's not asexual. <laughs> I'll, I'll tell you, <laughs> this is a, a totally common theme. Yeah, for people that I am I right? Like Absolutely. You, this is what you guys are doing as is your life's work. There's a lot of people that come out of the closet, but first they just think that they're not interested in sex. Yeah, and they I were think, in a mixed orientation marriage. Yeah, I think mixed orientation marriage and purity culture because I joined the church when I was 18, didn't get married till I was almost 24. So within that span of time, like, I'm at BYU, I'm on a mission, like, we don't talk about sexuality. It's, in fact, beaded into your head that, you know, you can't have any sort of relations Shut in that it way. Down. Like, don't kiss because, you know, what do they call it? Like, a front rub in the back room leads to, a, or no, a back rub in the front room leads to a front rub in the back room. They used to say that at BYU. Um, or, Stop, or, like, so dumb. or like, you know, just anything around sexuality was just poo-pooed. And so, yeah, I just I do remember the public shaming at one point when like something in a relationship had happened to me and I went to my bishop to confess it. And the bishop was like, 
trying to talk to me like, actually, it seems like you were manipulated into that situation and you didn't even want that to happen to you. But I thought that I wasn't supposed to take the sacrament for like a solid year at BYU. I didn't. And when you were on our podcast, you know, you talked about that. And it's just so interesting to me how that is a public shaming. And it's an act of like, see, if you do this, then you're going to have to look this way in front of all these ward members. And it affected dynamics and friendships for sure. Um, And isn't it interesting how for some people that causes them to double down? I mean, others are like, you know what? I don't want to be in this race. Yeah. But for others, maybe like you and me, that shame makes you want to double down to do this even more. Yeah. And I didn't at that point, I was so far in. I mean, I took every seminary class that I could before I joined the church. I was like so into Institute. And they thought she was Mormon already at BYU. Like I was just my testimony was so strong for not having grown up in the church because I needed it at a time. And it just came to me at a time when I was really in need. Uh, But something that I don't think we talk about as often, but that is equally as important when it comes to sexuality is because we were in the midst of purity culture when I did get married after my mission and wasn't super into like the sexual experience with my ex, I was hearing that from my friends too from my straight friends, like sex isn't great or, you know, I fake it so that I don't have to do it as long or, you know, do this, that or the other to avoid sexual experiences with your partner. So it was confusing to me. Like, I just assumed I was one of them, you know, that nobody likes it. So it's not just me. And I think that's why it took me so long to understand more about my sexuality and discover that part of myself. Does that, Fascinating. does that make sense? Yeah. I mean, yeah, I don't know if you heard that too, like in your early, especially when you're at BYU and you get married and everyone's like, oh, how was it? Like the night after They're talking the next about day. It. Yeah. I had a friend tell me you're in one of three categories. You either want to do it, you're indifferent, or you really don't want to do it. Mm. She said, most of the time I'm indifferent and I'll do it mm. unless I'm in that third category of like, like day one of my cycle or something mm. then I can say no mm. but yeah there notes. is a lot of pressure around that feel like we aren't encouraged to explore our own bodies so like, I feel For like I didn't sure. enjoy sex till after my deconstruction yeah. I feel like you need to deconstruct your sexuality oh, yeah. even if you do still identify as a straight mm-hmm. straight yeah, yeah I was 100 percent shut down until I was in this relationship with Sally I didn't know myself sexually at all so well, I went to a Jennifer Finlayson Lace and Fife uh like art of desire workshop like a two-day workshop and this is a person who did her PhD dissertation on female sexuality in the LDS church so she saw enough problems with the sexuality of females in the LDS church that she and now that's her life work. And it's not even about being queer. Right. Like so many women are having these problems. Exactly. So many. Exactly. Because of this patriarchal, like weird thing where like you're not supposed to like it. It's a, a responsibility to please your husband. Men are overly sexual. Yep. Women don't really have a sexuality. Yeah. And turn it off. And then one night, turn it all the way on. Mm-hmm. And it's and just it's for them. It's not for you. It's so messed up, man. Yeah. And so, you know, there she's overwhelmed with people that need her help. And there's a reason for that. I mean, I the first time I heard somebody say they wanted sex from their husband, I was just like floored. I was like, what are you? What are you? You ask for it? I was like so floored. And that was I think that was after my third baby. So wow. it was that long until I actually heard somebody that was like super into it. Yeah. I totally identify with that. So I totally. Yeah. What a shame. Yeah. yeah. Sex is awesome. There's so much around purity culture to unpack. Like you've basically been trained like you're you're disconnected from your body. Yeah. First of all, you're taught that your body isn't even yours. Right. And so self-exploration, which now I'm learning is sort of formative to developing your sexuality it's like one of the components right and that's totally discouraged and yeah i mean your body is off limits to mm-hmm. you kind of in a way yes. but it's, it's got to be available to your partner and it's just it's so just... messed up yeah i mean i'm 
um, really thankful to have been married to somebody who honored me and my path and wasn't ever like aggressively pushing anything. Like he was just so solidly himself and allowed me to be myself and very much a feminist. So I'll just say that. I feel super lucky in that department as well. Um, how did your faith deconstruction happen, Lena? So you you married your husband, Paul. We had four boys in four years. Um, our One of our twins uh, came home from primary one day, you know, asking about the temple and marriage in the temple and like, do boys and boys get married in the temple? And he was really young when he started talking about that. And so I remember having the conversation with Paul at the time, and it was just so easy. Like, we both were just like, well, duh, of course we choose our son over some church. And I started to question so many things after that. I remember it would took us still about four years to leave, but it was just, I saw everything, everything at that point through the lens of being very protective of him. And I'm sad and I am remorseful to admit that it took something within my own home for me to recognize that people were being marginalized and that there was hurt and pain and suffering within the congregations that I attended and wasn't aware of or didn't, I wasn't conscious of. And so when I met Sally, we just moved to California. My ex had just, you know, finished law school and internships and jobs out in DC. We moved here and I was not even really sure I wanted to go back in the building, but something inside of me was like, you know what? You need friends. And you know, historically, by going to church, you're going to find a friend. So I went to church and they gave me a calling in the young women, like right when I moved there. And so then- And I, this is Huntington yeah, Beach you're talking about. My, my ward, ward that she had just left. Okay. Yeah. So then like- Important she, component. Yeah. You guys are moving into the same ward yes, at this time. Yes. Yes. And, and like she mentioned, my one of the first friends I made there- who was also nuanced and on the peripheral. Um, she was a safe person I could talk to you about my circumstance, my family, and my beliefs, and she would share them with me. And it was just very validating. And she kept saying to me, like, you really need to meet my friend, Sally. And I just, you know, I was mouth jaw on the floor when I met her because she was just so attractive to me and I couldn't figure it out in my body. And there was just all these things happening. And, um, and but she was married, so I was like, "Oh, I guess she's not gay." She's like, gonna brush my shoulder off real quick. <laughs> I lo I'm loving every bit of this. Sally, had you already started deconstructing at that time? Yeah, I was out. She'd been out for one year. We met at church because she came to a trunk or treat, and um, she wanted to just have candy and a party for her kids to go to. It wasn't because she believed. So she was in the building. Oh my god! But I think it was her first time back at church since she'd left. Right? Yeah, it was. Yeah, a, I was a, a kind of a nervous nervous wreck uh, but I tried to act like I wasn't yeah it's so sweet our <laughs> kids remember playing together that night like that's the night they all met and they're all siblings now and it's so sweet <laughs> we were friends from October and then moved in together in June so it was quick and wonderful and great and hard and hard and hard <laughs> sure there was a lot of hard there because you know mm -hmm. you don't ever think you'll have to tell someone that especially somebody that like we were so committed to our marriage that didn't matter what problems were to come up, we would always stay together because our parents, we came from such tumultuous childhoods as far as divorces go. And so we were like, we're never doing that to then be yeah. faced with that and have to have to come to that decision. But ultimately, he and I know that that was the best decision that needed to be had. And, and we've, you know, just been there to support each other ever since. And your life experience going through a divorce must have really informed that process for you and how oh you God. how you navigated that too Absolutely. what to do, the do's and don't mm -hmm. we yeah. we committed to like rewriting the book on co-parenting from the moment that he found out so, yeah it, it wasn't none of it was good with their like their perspective like divorces and all that it was terrible for them and as children yeah as kids yeah. and and also they had you know um paul has been a, a he's a vet veteran he's been in war uh lena grew up with several stepdads uh she was alone a lot growing up and then they they had a lot of stuff that they went through together their twins almost died at birth being born at 28 weeks and they had a lot of stuff that like was traumatic and that they had been through and and shane and i on the other hand we both came from like intact little mormon families with not a lot of divorce 
even like in our experience around in our communities. And so uh, we had healthy kids and we were rocked big time, both of us, um, by this. This is kind of like our first big life event that was traumatizing other than we had left the church together. And that was uh, it was it was uh, heal like a good experience for our relationship to go through that together. And then the the divorce was just it blew up our worlds. And I think that kind of has informed a little bit about the difference between the relationships with the ex-husbands and, and how long it kind of has taken for Shane to come around and, and be a part of our family um, in the way that he is and it now. it seems, and just like in talking to you just as a friend, it seems like that you have a lot of sensitivity to that. Yeah, yeah. and Very complex dynamic. It is complex. And, you know, uh, you never really get divorced when you have kids with someone. It's just a, you, you never lose them as a part of your life. So I, I don't know that I had that. Like, I wanted him to be a part of our life. And I'm uh, it's just been it's been hard to figure out how to do it. And, um, you know, we're co-parents and we birthed these kids together. And so we're always going to be connected. And and so for anyone who's about to, you know, who's thinking about that, it's just like have that perspective. You're not going to get rid of this person. Mm -hmm. So so love them. And know that you're shooting yourself in the foot if you demonize that person. They're your kid's parent. Like, mm -hmm. you you have these little children that come first, right? Like, they are the priority and showing up for them is, you know, you can't divorce your kids. Like, they are your responsibility. So uh, when, you, when you fight with the parent, you're just hurting everyone. And, mm -hmm. and it's just... It doesn't have to look like we thought it looked. I think that's another way our generation is kind of like healing and changing things is the way divorce can look. Like, why does it have to be the way our parents did it, where nobody talks to each other and they talk shit about each other and they don't, you know, they're they're fighting. Why does it have to be that way? It doesn't. Let's talk about where the intersection happened. We talked about you guys meeting, mm -hmm. then you guys got together and like this documentary was that pretty transformative i mean they filmed year three of our relationship so we were together for two years i think that as far as transformation post-production um it's definitely been such a beautiful experience to watch the people around us who've transformed i mean her family has left the church because the producers were like on them with questioning and they had to really, really think about their belief in the church. Um, and Nan admits to that, that the documentary was definitely a part of the reason why she left, a big part. Um, yeah. And it happened in real time. We got to watch it the same night everyone else did. Dude, like, it was it happened crazy. While at, at, it was all happening. It was real. That part yeah. was really real. Yeah. Like, man. And it was uh, and I, awesome. It was so awesome as, oh. as me. Like, just, it was surreal. I was like, is this... Is this, am I dreaming here? Yeah. Like There is this very unique experience and I hope that it will become more common. But I just have to say, because today that we're filming is March 28th, the day that David Archuleta's song, Hell Together, mm -hmm. comes out. Yes. And that song is about his mom's experience, which is very similar to your parents' experience. Mm -hmm. There's an interview that your dad does where he's like, you know, he says to his ecclesiastic leader, leader I think it was like the bishop, like, my daughter is going to be marrying a woman, which means she's not welcome, basically, in our heaven. Mm -hmm. Like, what does that do for mm -hmm. me? And, it, like, that's what the whole song is mm -hmm. about. Do I even want eternal life if the people that I love most in this world, some of the people that I love mm -hmm. most in this world, aren't even going to be welcome there? Yes. Is that even a heaven that I want to participate in? And it's a story that I just hope gets more attention because I hope that more people will, you know, view that as a viable path yeah. that you can actually leave the church instead of leaving your child. Mm -hmm. It's so powerful. It's so, so powerful. like that, that I feel like that is like humanity at its best, mm -hmm. you know, for sure. I agree. Um, and uh, agree my more. mom just told me David Archuleta's mom has been showing up at a, a bunch of Thrive events and stuff. Yeah. She's been hanging out with she my parents. Is, so, so cool. pretty cool. Lupe, she is such a doll. Okay, you guys, um, a very important topic I want to get yes. into. 
Um, I would love to get your tips for LGBTQIA plus students at BYU. There is something that's going to be happening. I think it's going to be in the next school year. The students are going to receive Elder Holland's musket fire talk. I'm going to go ahead and include a, a clip here. Mm -hmm. I'd like to get your take on this. For example, we have to be careful that love and empathy do not get interpreted as condoning and advocacy, or that orthodoxy and loyalty to principle not be interpreted as unkindness or disloyalty to people. As near as I can tell, Christ never once withheld his love from anyone. But he also never once said to anyone, because I love you, you are exempt from keeping my commandments. We're tasked with trying to strike that same sensitive, demanding balance in our lives. In a way, Latter-day Saint scholars at BYU and elsewhere are, are a little bit like the builders of the temple in Nauvoo, who worked with a trowel in one hand and a musket in the other. Today, scholars building the temple of learning must also pause on occasion to defend the kingdom. I personally think, Elder Maxwell went on to say, this is one of the reasons the Lord established and maintains this university. The dual role of builder and defender is unique and ongoing. I'm grateful we have scholars today who can handle, as it were, both trowel and musket. Then Elder Oaks said challengingly, I'd like to hear a little more musket fire from the Temple of Learning. He said this in a way that could have applied to a host of topics in various departments, but the one he specifically mentioned was the doctrine of the family and defending marriage as the union of a man and a woman. It's awful. I have so many feelings about this that it's hard to like articulate what my feelings are because it 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 felt there was there was a lot of me that was like compassionate for the BYU students and like oh god this sucks for the people that have to be there and there was this other part of me that was like thank you for showing your true colors thank you for showing us how you really feel and not hiding it and it felt so much to me like about money about the donors like we want to make sure that the donors know which side of the fence we are mm -hmm. on this and we don't care if the kids suffer or if or if you know we need to make sure that we get our funding uh and at the expense of the kids and it felt violent for sure it felt violent to me it felt like uh and I know a lot of people like left the church over this, but it doesn't mean that there won't be a ton of queer kids that still have to go to BYU. Talk about why that is, because I feel like a lot of um, a lot of the listeners uh, are not LDS. A lot we have a lot of deconstructing evangelicals and things like that. Part of the experience of growing up Mormon is that you pay tithing, and that your tuition to BYU is subsidized basically. Mm -hmm. And so your child's tuition is going to be very consistent with like if they were to go to like a junior college, mm -hmm. but they're getting to go and have this big university experience, right? Mm -hmm. So for a lot of kids in the church, their parents won't even help with college. I mean, a lot of kids pay for their own college anyway, but number one, it's affordable. And number two, a lot of kids' parents won't pay for another university. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of these kids end up showing up on campus, even knowing ahead of time that they're not cisgender straight mm -hmm. and that they're going to this school. It really does feel like men, much of the time it's their only option. Um, and you're getting like a pretty prestigious education. You know, they're not just like, you know, AP classes in high school, although I was an AP teacher, which is great. But you're you're getting this experience from university professors who many of them have gone to Harvard and Yale. You know, they're they're people in their field that are so niche and equipped to inform the students of these very particular topics in whatever field they're in in academia. And so it's a good school and it's super hard to get into. So when you apply and your family's like so stoked that you get into BYU, it's a big deal. And your family's going to be really supportive and want to like help you financially not only pay for school but your housing because you're going somewhere where they can trust that you're going to be in a good environment and it's a clean what do they call that not a clean campus a dry dry campus right so there's no alcohol there's you know limitations to how late you can stay up and not having people of the opposite gender in your apartment or your bedroom and stuff and so there's these these 
It's like having a babysitter. Exactly. Like your parents the are parents like, I'll keep you. so much more at ease Say, when they know totally. that they have to, the kids that go there have to abide by the honor code. Yeah. And the honor code, if you're not going to church, right, you will get turned into the honor code and you will lose a place at BYU. Like you have to stay active as a Mormon person. Um, and those ecclesiastical endorsements are like basically a parent's stamp of like approval, right? They can finally say, yes, OK, I'm good because my kid is going to church or they're doing all the things they need to be doing as a faithful Mormon person. And then it gives them a sense of confidence that they'll go on a mission or they'll marry someone who's Mormon. And it just sort of sets them up for life. And so for us to judge, especially now on the other side, it's ridiculous. We cannot judge someone for going to BYU. This, these are children we're talking about. Yeah, here. that's the thing. Yeah. Like, I think number one, they're kids. They are not fully developed. They don't know who they are yet. They don't have financial stability. And like, this feels almost like a boy and a mission. Like, that's kind of how it felt for me. I was like, oh, going to BYU is part of the stepping stone, the next step on the Mormon ladder. Mm-hmm. And socially, like the social pressure, the familiar pressure mm-hmm. to go to a church school was enormous. Mm-hmm. And it was kind of like you're out of the club if you don't go to a church school. Like yeah. uh, you're you're not you're not going to uh, be you're going to lose come off your pedestal. Mm-hmm. You know, it's a lot of pressure. And it's like I, everything in my life was building up to that, like. Ever since I was a freshman, I'm like, okay, now my grades matter so I can make it into BYU. It's it's like oh, a yeah. long time. It's, it was a big deal to go there. And I wouldn't have been strong enough to stand up to my parents like if I didn't want to go there. I wouldn't have been like settled in my body or m- my life to go somewhere else. It's kind of like asking a kid to like move out and go on their own when they don't when they don't have the resources to do it. I think it's very unreasonable. And I can't imagine what it would be like to to unpack all of that at 45 years old and to think that people are expecting an 18 year old mm-hmm. to do this, a 17 or 18 year old. No. Like there's so many implications to this. This could mean you don't have communication with your parents anymore. I mean, there's so many implications. So going to this school for a lot of students, they found refuge in professors. There's a lot of professors or at least a handful of professors at the Y that are this way. And that was one of the things that he called out. Mm -hmm. So what you said, Sally, really resonates because it's like, okay, well, now at least we're seeing what we're getting. Mm -hmm. Like not only are you calling out, first of all, he called out Maddie Easton Mm -hmm. in that talk. Can you imagine being the student that he called out, mm. Elder Holland, an apostle, like mm-hmm. he calls him out. He says, um, he says, well, if a student's willing to commandeer the podium to divulge his sexuality, what's next? Mm-hmm. And it's just like we had Maddie on our these podcast are young students. right after this happened, um, like within a week or so, uh, he he came on to talk about what that experience was like for him. And Granted, at the time, he was starting a master's program, and he's a genius, and he's so smart and wise and intelligent. And even he really deeply struggled with being called out. And he had, you know, since left the church and had been living as a queer man out and proud, and it still, like, really affected his mental health. And not only that, but, like, the messaging. This is what's long-reaching and long-lasting is Maddie became, you know, this person for Elder Holland to use, but he represents so many of us and so many of the students that will enter into the school. And for them to now have this be a part of their, you know, mandatory welcome package or whatever, you know, information they're supposed to consume before they attend the university, it's like, okay, now just so you know, we want to remind you that there is not a safe space for you here if you're queer. And, and also, only, don't be loud exactly. about it. Yeah, not only is there not a sp- safe space for you, but we wanted to remind you again that we are an institution that is bigoted and homophobic. So yeah. so uh, the messaging, uh, you know, that Maddie Easton shared on our show on Hulu about him being sort of the representative 
for other queer students at the school and that his dear friend took his own life from not feeling like there was a space or a place for him in the church. That is so much more common than anyone is willing to talk about. And we all know it on the other side, but I'm saying those who are still within the four walls of the church, they give the suicide rate other excuses. They don't really look at what the foundational reasons are for it. They say they chalk it up to mean something else. And to me, there is blood on their hands when you are unwilling to look at the brutality that exists within your own organization that's causing these kids to take their own lives. And that goes for kids at BYU as well. So if you're listening to this and you are a BYU student, there are organizations at BYU. Bradley Talbot, who was featured as well on our show, The Lighting of the Why, The Rainbow Collective, like there are organizations that, that are available to you to help you. And there are safe people. You are not alone, even though it feels like you are. Do you have any words for parents of LGBTQ BYU students? Educate yourself. Go and be around queer people and hear the experiences from them before you unload onto your child, before you process this. Don't process this in front of them. Go away from them and take care of your own homophobia without damaging the relationship between you and your child. What your child needs when they come out is love mm -hmm. and unconditional acceptance and celebration. And if you don't understand, go learn because you don't know mm -hmm. and you don't get to question them. You don't. Mm -hmm. It's not your uh, responsibility to question them. They get to decide and you are potentially going to damage your relationship forever mm -hmm. and you will regret it. So go to resources, watch our show, go to Encircle if there's an Encircle near you. Also, their website has resources, and so does Mama Dragons. The Mama Dragons organization uh, was started by people who were Mormon or nuanced Mormon and now has just a whole plethora gamut of, of moms from never been Mormon to Mormon to ex-Mormon um, who have queer children or on anyone in the LGBTQ plus community as a part of their family. And the resources that they have invested their time and effort into are fabulous. I have been a member of Mama Dragons and they are so great. So if you are a parent of a queer person, I highly recommend you visit their website for courses and information around how to handle your, your circumstances much better than you would had you not had them. Schedule a call with me or my mother. <laughs> I was going to say, so as a coming out coach, both of you work in this space, yeah. right? So give us the handle again. Uh, well, we have a website, sallyandlena.com. Mm -hmm. So just go there. Okay, and perfect. Find everything okay, and I, and I have to ask you guys, is it fair to say that a lot of these kids, we'll call them kids because they're just in college, are dealing with their own internalized homophobia during this process as well? Definitely. Absolutely. Yeah, that's a big part of it. I think that self-hatred starts when you're so young and there isn't any representation in the congregation. And not only isn't there representation, but any talk of it and any reflection of the possibility of it, uh, there is just so much shame inundated and taught and uh, the proclamation to the family and how everything is centered on eternal families and how gender is this huge um, you know, foundational piece to celestial glory. And if you're a trans person, you're hearing that, you know, your inherent worth is diminished if you're not, you know, associating to the gender you are identified with as at birth. I mean, it just it's just so it's so frustrating to me how the church doesn't see um, the, the damaging effects of the family proclamation. Or they do and they're cool with it. Because we're supposed Even to be worse. homogenous. Yeah. If you go to the Black Menaces mm -hmm. uh, social media, they go around and interview kids on the BYU campus, and it's you'll so see good. the homophobia. Like they're just they're just regurgitating all of the shit that they've been taught their whole life. Mm -hmm. They don't think for themselves. They actually, I can tell they feel like so uh, conflicted because homophobia is taught. 
like their soul is having a hard time Mm -hmm. with that message because nobody nobody's soul is homophobic so it's really it's really sad to see and i would say that like i know are you going to ask us what's your advice for more uh, byu kids yeah so i wanted to close with that so if you can think about the students that are at the school there's not really a good option for them they've got really no recourse what are your words for that the number one thing is to find safe spaces to find community to find people you can talk to because when you keep it all inside that's where the untrue stories just keep running around and the worst case scenario keeps repeating we catastrophize when we keep it all inside and we lose our sense of reality and that's when the mental illness happens when you let it out and you can share and be honest and see that other people are there for you and that even if you have to stay at BYU, it's not forever. You can find community while you're there. You can do whatever you have to do to get through it with as much being yourself as you can. And then your life will start a new phase when you're out. But like there are tons of kids that are like you. Mm -hmm. You are definitely not alone. You can go to Encircle. You can go to the safe spaces. You can find people on social media. Please find community because that will keep you grounded enough and safe enough as you are in this really toxic environment. Mm -hmm. Um, And reach out for help, even if you're scared. Like, DM me. DM, you know, other kids. There are other kids. Don't keep quiet about it. You are safe. Mm -hmm. And Circle also provides therapy for these kids at BYU. Yeah. So it's something that's accessible to you. Yeah, it is. So I would recommend. I had no idea. Okay. I have to ask you guys, how important do you think deconstruction is? Do you think LGBT kids should be looking at their religious history? Is that helpful? Not helpful? Is it dependent on the person? I mean, I I can't hide the truth here. You know, if you're a queer person and you are in the church, um, it's time to uncover some of the, the shadow side of the church to understand more about why it's all just this made up story and none of it's actually real. And so you don't need to be or subscribe to an institution or a church or pay money to them. If you know, all the teachings and everything that they're um, portraying as truth actually doesn't have any validity to it whatsoever. So I don't want to like terrify anyone, but I do think that it would be important to start somewhere the sooner the better, yeah. honestly, because if you that like the, there's so many people that know they're queer and then they just have shame because they think it's wrong. Right. Because if they be- and a lot of people still believe the church is true. Right. Yeah. It's, it's And so they're like, I'm gay, but I'm also a member of the church of, you know, don't get me so started. What, oh, that's a topic your, that's hard. What's for your us. what's your favorite deconstruction resource? Is Mm. it like the CES letter? Mine is the CES letter because that's what I use. Yeah. I do think uh, Mormon Stories is super helpful. There's like thousands of episodes now. The Tom Phillips. And LDS discussions. Yes. The The Tom Tom Phillips Phillips episode is the one that uh, opened me up to reading the CES letter. And by episode, she means like eight. I think there's eight episodes of Tom Phillips. (laughs) It is. Um, it is unbelievable. Yeah, Tom Phillips. He it. was a seven. He was a seventy, I believe, mm-hmm. in England. Had his second anointing. Yeah, and deconstructed. Yeah, I I also just think that like your TikTok and Kara Burrell and Nuance Ho and anyone online who's like talking about church history and bringing up things that are, um, you know, hypocrisies about the church, even just like the recent thing with the women in the church. Um, saying that it's, you know, a more equal space for women than other organizations. And, you know, the discussion around the patriarchy and stuff, it's just so, so interesting. There's so much online to uncover. And and those those can be resources that can keep you alive. Like, Mm -hmm. those can Mm -hmm. be lifelines for you as you just, like, keep listening to people who uh, have been to the other side and giving you hope and, and validating your feelings. Like, Mormon Stories... And all these resources were really fundamental for me as I was exiting and and having an existential crisis uh, because because that can go along with finding out you're queer. And it's not a it's not a small deal. 
you know, but they're, these resources are free Mm -hmm. and they're available. And, uh, no matter what your parents end up saying, like your life matters. Mm -hmm. I always feel like anyone who is either the person dealing with this shift or the parents of the person, they should read the CES letter. Mm -hmm. The thing that I've come to that, like I tell kids who are like on the fence, I'm like, if you are going to give your entire life to something, if you're going to go spend two years preaching something, if you're going to, you know, keep giving everything that you are to an organization, don't you want to have all the information, mm-hmm. like all of it? Just information. It's not informed you know, consent. Informed people. consent. Like we don't have informed consent being mm-hmm. born into the church. Just, yeah. Just make sure you believe it. Just make sure. Like, hey, if, if you, you still if you, believe it. Yeah. That percentage Look is, in the box. Is, is small, which, you know, it's not likely right. you will, but it's it's like it shouldn't be that threatening, you know? Mm-hmm. But mm-hmm. if you're willing to make this a divide between you and your child, you should go look in that box. Mm-hmm. Exactly. But I just wanted to say something about Charlie Bird and Ben Shalotti and the Charlie Birds of the world. Please. Which is just that I I truly believe that the disservice they're doing to members of the church is something that will be like long lasting. There will be long lasting effects because they are preaching from these big platforms that it's okay to be Mormon and gay and that it's a safe environment for them. When we all know, especially those of us who are on the other side and are willing to point out the truth, that it couldn't be further from the truth. So the experience that Charlie Bird is having in the church, Mm -hmm. attending each week with his husband, Mm -hmm. having an assignment in the ward, taking the sacrament, do you feel like that reflects the experience that most gay people are entitled to being in the church? Absolutely not. I do think, as most of us talk about as former Mormons, there's such thing as Bishop Roulette, right? You get to you don't get to choose where you live or what ward you're in, but sometimes you're in a ward that's way more accepting. But that particular ward isn't speaking for like Salt Lake, you know, the the prophet and the apostles. They're, every time there's a general conference, they confirm to us how unsafe it is for gay people. So I... It's giving false hope. Exactly. For change. I do not respect what Charlie Bird is doing. I think it is so harmful to the queer community, especially those who are children and looking up to him as an example, like, oh, I can be gay and I can stay because poor, I don't remember their sweet names, but they were on Latter-gay Stories and on Mormon Stories. And they're a cute couple. And they both, two men, went on missions, believed in the church wholly and completely, came home, got married, stayed in church, and they were both excommunicated. And they were excommunicated really young, like early 20s, publicly. And they're shamed. And they're standing in front of, you know, the stake, stake presidency and the high council when you get excommunicated. And one of them told the story of like, you know, they asked him, why Why did you choose to get married? Why did you choose to have sex with a man? And he said it was either choosing to get married or choosing to die because I couldn't live my life without the like completion of love. Like, this is who I am as a person. I can't deny myself that. And even so, those two sweet boys, they still had testimonies of the church when they were getting excommunicated. So fast forward two years, Charlie Bird in this ward marries this man and they take pictures in front of the temple and they take the sacrament, which, by the way, taking the sacrament doesn't mean they have any special right. People who are investigating the church take the sacrament. OK, I I just I hope people understand that it's a false message, false hope, and it's really, really damaging for the queer people who are in the church to believe that that's a safe place for them. And also, I I feel like he is privileged. He's white. He's handsome. He's a man. He he's has cisgender. influence with his Instagram. He, he's a far public. He's influence. a public figure. Yes, and uh, I can see why he might like to be in the church and why there might be uh, benefits for him to be in there. But that's not the case for most people. We are putting ourselves in a place where we are less than, voluntarily second-class citizens in this organization. And that's what he's asking other people to do, mm-hmm. to to dishonor themselves mm-hmm. by putting themselves in a place where they are not given equality, mm-hmm. basic human rights. They're like, he's like, put yourself in this situation. Go to a place who teaches that 
who you are is a sin and that you will never be able to reach the celestial kingdom with your family in heaven. Like, how can you ask people to do that? The most tragic component from what I can see is the parents of these kids that are like, see, Mm -hmm. he's doing it. They're really putting him up on a pedestal as see, it's possible. You can be gay and you can be a faithful member of the church. Mm -hmm. And it's an expectation. It's a brutal expectation. Mm -hmm. Absolutely brutal. I think there's a lot to unpack here. And everything that I've heard from the LGBT community is exactly what you're saying. Mm -hmm. It's just not a fair representation of what the experience is like to be a gay member of the church. No. So you guys, thank you so much for sitting down with me. Before we sign off, can we just highlight your platforms one more time? So we've got Mormon No More, which is the documentary series, sallyandlena.com. Yeah. And they can access your coaching services there. Any other offerings you want to mention before we close out? Peace out podcast. And on sallyandlena.com, you will see a drop down for the course that came out over Christmas. And like I mentioned at the beginning, we're offering 50% off for the launch of our third season of our podcast. And just put in Faith Unraveled and you'll get that 50% off. You guys are amazing. Thank you so much for the work that you're doing in this community. And I love and appreciate you guys so much. We love you too. All right, you guys. Thanks everyone for joining us today. Please tell us what you thought in the comments. We'll see you next time. Love you. Peace out.